Greetings, retro friends. This is a Remex punch tape reader. Specifically, it's an RRS 7155. So the idea is that you would have some punch tape, and if you'll recall last episode, I actually punched some tape, and it would just go through this thing down here, and it would read all the holes, and it would output on a DB25 uh, 25 pin connector. Now, I also happened to find on eBay the manual for this. Uh, unfortunately, this was a photocopy of the original manual, so any, um, any of the nice grayscale images are unfortunately all washed out, um, but it does come complete with schematics, full-size schematics, which was actually surprising for a photocopy. So this will be able to tell us how it works and um, you know, if something doesn't work, I'll hopefully be able to fix it. Now the idea here is um, here I have a roll of punch tape that I bought on eBay. I have no idea what's on it. Uh, there is a label on it that says uh, LBR5 or possibly 6.2 and also T equals 121.11 degrees Kelvin. I guess that means that this is maybe some lab measurements taken at that temperature or maybe a simulation or something. Anyway, uh, it would also be nice to, to just read this and see what's on it. Uh, anyway, so the idea is that this would have actually been placed on a spool like this and the take up reel is over here. So the tape would go down here, around here, up through this reader, down here, over here, and then around into the take-up reel. And these are tension arms, uh, which presumably work exactly the same way as the uh, perforator did, where it can adjust the uh, spooling for proper timing. Now the interesting thing is, is that if we take a look inside the machine, let's show you that, uh, here are some parts. Here's a transformer. Here are some bulk capacitors for the power supply. Uh, this here is a bridge rectifier. So this is, you know, just your ordinary AC power supply. Um, so the interesting thing is, uh, this is one of the spooler motors, and this is a potentiometer. So as I move the tension arm, you can see that the potentiometer actually moves. And this is not uh, what we saw on the perforator, which was just a simple switch and would just turn the motor on and off. Uh, the motor actually rotates at different speeds depending on the tension. Uh, same thing here on the other side. Here is the motor for the uh, supply reel, and this is its tension potentiometer. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that works. Uh, we've got some buttons on the front, the usual on-off button. Uh, we have what appears to be a backwards and forwards button and also a loop load spool. This is the logic card back here. Uh, there are a whole bunch of potentiometers over here which adjust things like um, timings and thresholds. And if we take a look at the back, there's not a whole lot back here. This is where the AC comes in. And this is the 25 pin connector that the data will come out on. Uh, in addition to this, I also received in the package uh, some extra light bulbs. And the light bulbs uh, come into play over here and they basically just shine the light through the holes and there are detectors in here and those potentiometers, which we saw over here, presumably set the thresholds for, uh, for the light. So when a hole comes in, the light goes through, the detector goes off. When there's no hole, light doesn't go through. Um, and of course, for paper tape like this, the interesting thing is, well, how do you set the threshold? Because you know, if it's a very bright light, it's gonna set off the detector even through the paper. Something like this uh, Mylar tape, of course, won't have any light going through it at all if there's no hole. So uh, what I thought was we would just start by plugging it in and seeing what happens. Okay, so what I've done is I've loaded up um, the former uh, feed reel or whatever you call it and put it in the take up position, um, I guess. 
maybe it's the take up. I don't know which way this thing is supposed to go um, or which way this thing is supposed to read. So um, what I'm going to try to do is spool the tape and see what happens. So let me turn it off, plug the power in, make sure that I've got my 25 pin connector connected, which I do, and I'll turn it on. Okay. And now I'm going to put it in the spool position and see what happens. Aha. Uh -huh. So as you can see, it sort of loaded itself up. Now, if I move the arrows, we can see that we can actually move the tape around. Okay, so clearly something is going on here where uh, the motor is actually not able to keep up with the feed rate on here. Uh, let's do the opposite now. Okay, that seems to be okay, so there's some adjustment that I need to do. Because it's not able to move this motor as fast. Okay, and in the other direction, yeah, everything's just fine. Okay. So the next thing that I should be able to do is do exactly that, except through the DB25 connector, the 25 pin connector. So let's see, let's drive right, which is pin 16. Okay, and that actually seems to be slower, which makes sense because the manual says that it will go at a certain speed but then when you hit the buttons, it'll go faster. So let's go the other direction, which is drive left, 17. Yeah, and that all seems to work. Now, one thing that I should uh, point out is that the only thing that's driving the tape is this sprocket motor, right? So if the sprocket motor moves the tape this way, this tension arm is going to be pulled this way, and this tension arm is going to be released this way, and that causes these motors to spin to move these tension arms back to their neutral position. So really, it's only this motor that's, that's kind of controlling the whole thing. So the next thing that we need to do, um, aside from you know, make a note that we should take a look at the, uh, the voltages over here and maybe adjust that, the next thing that we need to do is take a look at the outputs um, and see what sort of data we're getting. So I'll just uh, maybe hook up an oscilloscope and make sure that we're getting some signals. Okay, here we go. Yeah, all right. So we're obviously seeing data. Here, I'll run it the other direction now. Okay, so clearly we're seeing some good data. So let's set up the Raspberry Pi to drive this and read some data. Now, the way it works is this. There is a data ready signal. So data ready. And the data ready signal basically means that the tape is stopped on a character. So when the data ready signal goes high, then we can actually start reading whatever the data is right over here. Now, we also have the drive signal, and the drive signal is an active low signal. So let's suppose we're driving it, and all of a sudden the data ready line goes high. Well, at that point, we can stop driving the tape. And then we can read the data. So let's say we're going to read the data right here. And then after we read the data, we can drive the thing again. Now, as we drive it, as we drive the tape, the data ready will eventually, when the holes leave the, uh, the um, area of the light, the data ready signal will go low. And we're going to continue to drive it until the data ready signal goes high again at which point we are going to stop driving the tape. 
read the data, and let the tape go again. And we let the tape go, and then eventually the holes leave the reading area, the holes enter the reading area, so the data is ready, and we stop the tape again and read the data. So that's basically what we're going to do. And the other thing is uh, there is a minimum uh, here, or actually, I guess the minimum would be this. And there's also probably a minimum drive pulse as well. And I think the minimum drive pulse is something like 500 microseconds. And the minimum between the data ready and driving, I think, is 0.5 microseconds. So that's really small, but this is a more important number uh, because it basically means you can't drive this really at more than um, a certain amount. Um, in this case, I guess it would be, well, 2,000 characters per second. But it turns out that um, the tape is capable of being driven at a maximum of 400 characters per second. And if you drive it like this, uh, the capability is actually only 200 characters per second, which basically corresponds to a delay. So it's uh, 0.005 seconds or 5 milliseconds per character. And that equals 200 characters per second. Okay, so that's what we're going to do, and that's the program that I wrote. So, as before, I have the cable going down here. This is a Cat5 cable. And it goes up to the Raspberry Pi. Now, here's the breakout board, and you can see that I've got um, the wires going to a breadboard. And if we look at the breadboard, we can see some resistors. Those are 10K resistors, and they go directly to the inputs of the Raspberry Pi. And the reason that I did that is that the Raspberry Pi's inputs are not 5 volt tolerant, and yet we're outputting 5 volt signals. So the resistors basically limit the current that goes to the Raspberry Pi, so that even though I'm uh, sending it 5 volts, uh, the Raspberry Pi will only, the, the resistors will drop enough voltage to drop that below 3.3 volts. So let's go ahead and run the program. And I have the program set up to read 256 characters. Now you can see that on the leader part of the tape, all we're going to be reading is FFs. So if I were uh, writing a program to read the entire tape, I could just say, okay, read FFs and throw them away until you find the first non-FF character. So let's go ahead and read 256 characters. And this is going at not, um, not the full speed. Uh, it's going at, I think, about 160 characters per second. So let's see what happens. Ah, OK. So that little click that you heard uh, sort of says, I think, that uh, something didn't work somewhere along the way. And I wonder what it could be. Okay, so I turn the machine off and advance the tape a little bit, and I think I know what's going on. If I can zoom in on the tape, we can see that there's this double punched area, and apparently that caused um, the thing to malfunction for some reason. So now that I'm past that, I think that I can start the program up again. Okay, so we've read 256 characters. So let's see what those characters are. Okay, and these are the characters. So the FFs that you see in the beginning are actually the, um, the uh, leader. And then after that, it looks like uh, we see a bunch, now this is hex, so it kind of looks like we see a bunch of ASCII uh, numerals. 
So for example, immediately after the leader, we get an AD character and then a 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then an AC and an AB, and then a 0, 0, 0, 3, 8, 5, and then another AC and an AB, and so on. Uh, and, you know, there are some other characters in there. Again, I have no idea what this means. Uh, AC and AB are not anything that I recognize. Um, there's also some 8D, 8A characters in there. Um, but the interesting thing is the, uh, the ASCII numbers. So apparently these are, you know, maybe some, some numeric records. Uh, but there's nothing else that's interesting in here. Uh, we can read some more data and see what we get. Just more of the same. Yeah, and that's just still more of the same, just numbers followed by record separator characters and then more numbers. The numbers appear to be uh, six digit numbers. I guess we could just continue reading to the end of the tape. Let me just modify the program to read uh, a few more characters than 256. Let's read, say, I don't know, 1024. Okay, and it looks like we're almost at the end of the tape, so let's just read some more data. Okay, how much tape have we got? We've still got probably about another K of data. I think there's probably about 15 or 20 K of data on this tape. And that was it. So that's what happens when you run out of tape. Uh, we read the end, which was another leader, which is a bunch of uh, Fs, FFs. Uh, but yeah, it, it basically seemed to end on uh, the, the end of a record. Uh, the interesting thing is, remember I said that there were ACABs. Uh, let me show you the screen. So here we are at the end of the tape, and you can see that we read the, uh, I guess you could call it a trailer, which is a bunch of FFs. And you can see that uh, there are these six digit records. Um, it looks like they're basically ASCII zero, um, followed by the record separator, ACAB. And then we get a final uh, six zero characters. And then the very last character is a B8. Maybe that means end of data. Uh, and then we just get FFs, which is the, the trailer. So that was about it. Um, all told, there was probably about uh, maybe 15 or 20K on that tape. Well, I suppose that's it for this uh, fun punch tape exercise. So we've been able to punch tape using a perforator and read tape using a tape reader. Uh, and we read a tape that I got off of eBay and it did not seem to contain anything very interesting. It was apparently a data tape and it had, uh, it didn't have any actual executable code on it, which would have been maybe a little more interesting because then we could actually look at the data and see perhaps what kind of processor it was for. But alas, uh, this is all I got. Well, I will actually start looking for other tapes on, uh, on eBay and you know see if we can find some more interesting data about that. But until then, I will see you. Bye-bye.